Folks, uh, we have uh, Sherry Crabtree with us this evening, and Sherry is an Extension Associate at Kentucky State University, and it's an honor to have her uh, this evening. Um, uh, we were talking earlier, uh, we're covering pawpaws, and I think we all know about the wild pawpaws that are out here uh, on the side of the mountain uh, or uh, in, our, uh, in our front or backyards or whatever, but uh, uh, there's one thing about it, there, uh, there's a better pawpaw out there, uh, more varieties of pawpaws that are actually commercially available. And so, uh, Sherry, we've got her here this, this evening to talk a little bit about uh, uh, pawpaw production. And as a matter of fact, Kentucky State is one of the premier uh, research locations for pawpaw production. So uh, yeah. without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Sherry then. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for having me. It's good to see everybody. Let me turn my screen sharing on and get, um, get the PowerPoint going. Um, I said thank you all for having me. And I'm Glad you mentioned that. Kentucky State University, we're actually the only full-time pawpaw research program in the world. So there are other universities that are doing, um, you know, some pawpaw research, but we're the only university in the entire world that has a program dedicated just to pawpaws. So that is pretty exciting. So we're going to talk just about all about growing pawpaws today. So first, I think most of you all are probably familiar with pawpaws, but just to recap, the scientific name is Asimina triloba, and pawpaw is in the custard apple family. The rest of that family is all tropical fruits, tropical and subtropical. So like custard apple, cherimoya, soursop, fruits like that, that are all tropical. Pawpaw is the only temperate member of the family. So that's why the tree has kind of a tropical appearance. The fruit has a somewhat tropical flavor, which makes sense because the rest of the family is tropical. It's a pretty slow growing, medium sized tree and um, kind of a pyramidal shape in full sun. And you'll notice the big difference. If you're used to seeing wild trees in the woods, they have a pretty different growth habit than trees in full sun. Full sun, they're a lot more dense pyramidal. Um, in the woods, in the shade, they grow kind of more tall and skinny and open, lanky appearance. So the fruit are in clusters. Um, sometimes you see single fruit. Um, usually two to five fruit in a cluster though. And the fruit of these improved varieties can be a half a pound to a pound in size, usually about a half pound on average. Um, but of course, a lot of wild fruit would be smaller than that. So the fruit itself, again, has a tropical flavor and aroma. Um, the best description for people who haven't eaten pawpaw before is a banana mango combination but there are some different undertones of pineapple, melon, coconut, uh, caramel, vanilla, different flavors like that that you'll get in the undertones. The flesh when it's ripe is like a soft custard-like texture similar to a ripe avocado. Um, Papa fruit, very nutritious, high in a lot of minerals, vitamins, antioxidants. So here in Kentucky, in our area, um, pawpaws flower in April and May. So usually starting about mid-April, and it's right after red buds and dogwoods. So that's kind of a marker, right? When the dogwoods are wrapping up, usually the pawpaws start blooming. Um, they flower before the leaves come out. They're kind of late to leaf out. There are um, both male and female parts on the same tree and the same flower. Pawpaws do need to cross pollinate. You do need two different trees, but it's not because they're separate male and female trees. That's just because they're not self-compatible. So you do need at least two trees for good pollination. Um, one of our graduate students recently did a study and found that they will set some fruit through self-pollination, um, but they're just not very self-fruitful. Though, If you have a single tree, you may get a few fruit, but not very many. And one unique thing about pawpaws is they are pollinated by flies and beetles rather than bees. Pawpaw is a good landscape tree. It has this nice bright golden yellow fall color. The flowers are pretty. They're kind of bell-shaped, maroon colored. And pawpaw attracts the zebra swallowtail butterfly, which is the butterfly you see in the lower right. 
it's actually the exclusive host plant for zebra swallowtail larvae. So if you want to attract that particular butterfly, you want to have pawpaw trees. Um, some people plant pawpaw trees just for that purpose that have butterfly gardens um, to attract that butterfly. So the native range of pawpaw is most of the eastern United States, the um, Appalachian region, the Ohio River Valley, um, kind of the Midwest, Mid-South area is the native range for pawpaw. So we're right in the middle of it. That's why we have a lot of wild trees here. But pawpaws can be grown in USDA growing zones five through nine. So basically anywhere it doesn't get um, extremely cold, they're hardy to about 25 below. So like Minnesota, North Dakota, they're not cold hardy there. And they do need some winter chilling. Um, we're starting to do research on that, but it's estimated to be about 400 hours. So anywhere except the very hottest areas, um, you know, like South Florida, um, far Southern California that don't get any chill hours. And they can be grown around the world. There are people growing pawpaws in parts of Europe and Asia. So basically anywhere with that temperate climate, they can be grown. So since pawpaw is a native plant, there's a lot of history with pawpaws in the U.S. The first written record of pawpaws was from um, explorer Hernando de Soto, and they recorded they, um, they saw Native Americans growing and eating pawpaws in the Mississippi River Valley. And probably a lot of the spread of pawpaws farther north, there's some kind of little isolated populations, and they're a lot of those are where there were Iroquois settlements, like around the Great Lakes and New York, places like that. So Native Americans were responsible for a lot of spread of pawpaw. Lewis and Clark, who were early explorers um, of the Western U.S., record in their journal, they were on their way back. They had explored to Oregon. They were on their way back from Oregon. In Missouri, they ran out of food and had to forage for food and survived on pawpaw fruit for several days. So they reported that pawpaws helped save them from starvation. Um, George Washington, it's re recorded that chilled pawpaw fruit were his favorite dessert. Thomas Jefferson, um, you may know, was into plants. He was kind of a horticulturist. He sent pawpaw seeds to some of his friends or acquaintances in France. So he probably introduced pawpaws to Europe. Um, Daniel um, Boone, Mark Twain were also pawpaw fans. So in the wild, pawpaw is native here. Um, so you may see patches like this. Pawpaw is usually found in the understory of hardwood forests along um, rivers and streams, creeks, um, up on banks um, adjacent to rivers and creeks is the most common area that they're found in. And they form these big patches that are usually just spread by root suckers. Um, so there'll be shoots that come up, you know, in a pretty large area, all from one original tree. And a lot of times these wild patches don't produce a lot of fruit. And that's for a few reasons. Um, one is the shade, even though in the wild natively they grow in the shade, they don't produce a lot of fruit in shade. And also remember they're not self-compatible. They need another pawpaw to pollinate with to set very many fruit. And even though that may look like a lot of fruit or a lot of trees in that patch, if they're all spread by root suckers, they're all clones of each other, essentially. They're all from one root system. So there may, even in this big patch, may not be a genetically different tree to cross-pollinate with. And there may just be a lack of pollinators, the flies and beetles. Um, in the woods, they're not as active as bees sometimes. So if you have wild pawpaw patches, which a lot of people do, um, there's some strategies to manage them to make them more productive. Um, thin them out. Sometimes the, the shoots will come up, the root suckers will come up pretty close together. So you wanna select the strongest trees and thin them out to about eight feet apart, eight feet between trees at least. Um, prune out surrounding trees that are shading the pawpaws or just prune branches or clear out trees to let more light in and clear out some of the underbrush that is competing with the pawpaw trees. And you can also bring in either ad additional trees, either seedlings or grafted trees from another place to um, have genetic diversity and have cross-pollination. You can also graft 
the wild trees, you can use bark inlay grafting if you're familiar that, with that to top work wild trees if the fruit, the wild fruit is poor quality. And a lot of people want to dig and transplant the root suckers. That's hard to do um, because they don't have a lot of root system of their own. They're really kind of connected by just like a runner to the main tree. The best way to do that if you want to is um, cut around the root sucker that you want to transplant with a shovel um, and just leave it in place for a year and that will sever the runner root and leaving it there will develop a little bit more of its own root system. And then the next year, the following spring, um, spring is the best time to transplant pawpaws, you can dig that up and move it. So a little bit of the history, um, you know, pawpaws best known to a lot of people as a wild plant. But back in 1916, so over 100 years ago, the, the American Genetics Association had a contest to find the best pawpaw. And they predicted at that time that um, with breeding that a commercial pawpaw industry would begin. And of course that didn't happen. We, we don't find pawpaws in you know, Kroger and Meyer and the big grocery stores. And the main reason for that is probably just the rapid perishability it has a really short shelf life when it's ripe. And things with produce now is so centered around shipping it cross country and storing it for long periods of time. So it still is kind of a local fruit at farmer's markets. So then in the 90s, um, late 80s and 90s, there was a resurgence in interest in pawpaw. The Pawpaw Foundation was founded, um, KSU, we started our pawpaw research program in 1990. The Ohio Pawpaw Festival, which is in Athens, Ohio, um, started in 1999. And then the North American Pawpaw Growers Association, which the grower association started out in Ohio, was started in 2000. So the main goals of our program at KSU are preserving and evaluating genetic diversity in pawpaw. Um, we're breeding to develop superior cultivars, um, doing orchard management recommendations for growers, whether it's you know pest control, irrigation, fertilization, things like that, and assisting farmers, anybody from commercial growers to just backyard growers and enthusiasts with growing pawpaw trees. And we've done some work with um, post-harvest storage and developing recipes. So if you want to grow pawpaw trees, whether if you want to plant an orchard or if you just want, want to plant a couple of trees on your property, you want to select a good site. And it's similar to other tree fruits, so it would be similar to a site that you would choose for apples or other fruit trees. So you want a place with good air drainage. You don't want to plant in the very lowest lying areas are going to be frost pockets since the cold air is heavier and settles in those areas. Pawpaws like a deep, fertile, well-drained soil with a lot of organic matter. Um, they're tolerant of some different soil types. So, you know, if there's some clay in the soil, that's okay, as long as it's somewhat well-drained, not too heavy, and a slightly acid to neutral pH. And the most important things, pawpaws are pretty low maintenance and easy to grow, but the main things are weed control. They don't compete well having a lot of grass and weeds and stuff growing up around the tree. So you can um, use mulch, straw, wood chip mulch. If you just have a couple of trees, just pull the weeds around the tree or hoe them. In our orchard, since we have a lot of trees, we do use glyphosate um, and that's okay to use with pawpaws. You wanna be careful with root suckers. You, if they're root suckers, make sure you don't spray them or they're cut down because that will be brought up into the main tree. Um, also, irrigation um, is the main thing other than weed control that you have to have with pawpaw trees. Irrigation are just a water source to water the trees with, especially the first couple of years after they're, while they're getting established, they need a good amount of water to stay, um, stay pretty moist. And just like with any fruit trees or any crop, you want to do a soil test before you plant, ideally to see if you're deficient in any nutrients before you plant that you might want to amend. And a lot of people think the pawpaws have to grow in the shade since in the wild they're found in the shade, but actually they get um, highest yields in full sun and they will grow in full sun. They do need protection from sun until they're about 18 inches tall. So really small seedlings are sensitive to full sun, but after that they can grow in full sun. The recommended spacing is eight to 10 feet between trees. 
you don't want to go any farther than 30 feet or there may be problems with pollination. And we do 18 to 20 feet between rows and spring planting is recommended for pawpaws rather than fall. And the reason is pawpaw roots are thought to not grow over the winter. A lot of trees, they're still active and the roots are growing during the winter, but pawpaws don't. So you plant them in the fall and they just kind of sit there until spring. As far as maintaining the trees after you plant them, um, pruning, a lot of people ask about that. It's kind of your preference for how you want your tree to look. We actually did a study looking at pruning to central leader, so pretty much the same as an apple tree versus minimal pruning, um, which was basically no pruning at all, just if there was like a broken limb or something really bad that needed to be removed. The trees that were pruned to central leader were stronger. They had fewer broken limbs. They were easier to harvest from because they're more open. You can reach in and see the fruit better. And we thought that being more open like that the fruit might get sunburned, but that was not a problem. They were a little bit slower to start producing fruit and had, at least at first, slightly lower yields. They ended up catching up, but um, just because you're removing some of the wood that would be producing fruit. And they were a little bit, of course, more labor to prune, but then it's a little bit less labor when you're harvesting. So, what we've ended up, how we manage our trees is kind of in between. We don't leave them totally unpruned, but we don't prune them as intensively as an apple tree. We remove um, the very lowest branches, so anything that would be touching the ground when it has fruit on it or getting in the way of mowing and weed eating. And we would remove branches that have really narrow, so like if it has a double central leader, like two trunks that are growing straight up like that, or a really narrow branch angle, we would remove things like that. Um, pawpaws do usually need some nitrogen. We use urea in our conventional orchards. Then we have an organic area that we use. Um, it's called Nature Safe. That's a bone, blood, and feather meal. Um, but any nitrogen source is okay. Um, fish emulsion in the greenhouse we use like Miracle Grow or Peters. And so on trees in the field, one to three ounces of nitrogen per tree the first few years, and then as they start to get a little bit less vigorous when they get older, go up to four or five ounces of nitrogen. And you don't wanna do it too late in the year because um, they need to start shutting down for the fall. So by August 1st, you wanna stop fertilizing. The, like urea, we just apply it once in the spring. So in March is when we'd apply something like that. One problem we have seen in trees and, this is probably because, you know, in the wild they're found in the shade. So even though they produce more fruit in the sun, there are some ways that they're not totally adapted to growing in sun. So they get the southwest injury or sun scald sometimes um, cracking on the trunk. So you may be familiar with this in other fruit trees, but in the wintertime the tree is dormant and the sunshine's strongest on the southwest side of the tree and heats the bark up on that side and the sap, sap starts flowing, it kind of dehardens it and brings it out of dormancy a little bit and then it gets cold again at night and it's kind of a, a freeze-thaw cycle or just damage from losing dormancy and then getting cold again and it causes cracking on the southwest side of the tree. So we have started painting the tree trunks white with white latex paint. So it's two-thirds um, white latex paint, one-third water. We spray them. You could just paint if you have a couple of trees or you can use trunk wraps, like light color trunk wraps work the same way also. So the light color reflects the sunlight and doesn't cause that bark getting so hot and then cooling off again. So that will, that can kill the tree. You see the photos, especially the one in the far bottom um, left really can be really severe cracking. So if it's enough that it goes deep enough or if it girdles the tree, then it can kill the tree. This is the main disease that we see. Pawpaw is relatively free of insect and disease problems, but this is the main thing that we see is this phyllosticta. It's a fungal spot. So we see it on the leaves and on the fruit. And we are looking at using sulfur or copper to control it. Um, a graduate student has looked at that for um, there weren't really many fruit or weren't any fruit really to do it this year. She did it last year and they 
it seemed like they worked on the leaves, but not on the fruit for some reason. The fruit has kind of a waxy cuticle layer, so that may be why. So we're hoping to find some control measure. And it's worse, you know, if you have a lot of trees all together. So if you just have a couple of trees in your yard, you may never see this, it may not be a problem. But when you have a lot of pawpaw trees in close proximity like we do, then the um, disease inoculum just gets built up and the leaves on the ground and you can see it. So usually it's just cosmetic. So the fruit and the bottom center the spots on it, if you cut that open, it'll be fine on the inside. It doesn't cause any kind of rot or anything like that. So it's mostly just a cosmetic problem, except in a really severe case, like on the far right, it can cause cracking of the fruit because those spots are kind of, it makes the skin kind of brittle. And then as the fruit grows, it can make it crack. And that's worse, just like any fungal diseases, it's worse in wet years. It needs moisture to spread. These are a couple of insects that we see sometimes, but are not a major problem, nothing you need to spray for. The Asimina webworm moth, it's similar to fall webworm that makes, um, kind of makes nests at the tips of branches. Um, if you know Cliff England at England's Orchard and Nursery, for some reason he has a lot of that. We've never seen it at our farm and he has quite a few of those. So I think it depends on your location. You can usually just cut them out, cut them out of the end of the branches, but something like BT that works against caterpillars would work for it. Um, Papa peduncle borer is a little moth that bores into a lot of parts of the flower. The peduncle is the stem that attaches the flower to the tree. So that's where it was first found was uh, burrows into those and makes the flower shrivel up and die. Um, but it will get into the twigs and into the fruit too but it is not a major problem in the fruit. We've counted it before and collected data on it, and it's in like three to 5% of the fruit. So it's not anything that you need to spray for. You just wanna be aware if you see that frass coming out of the fruit to know that one is in there, but it's not something that you see frequently. There is a pawpaw sphinx um, moth that again, we hardly ever see that. Japanese beetles will feed on pawpaw a little bit, but it's not one of their preferred plants. They get on grapes and peaches and blackberries and other crops a lot worse than on pawpaws. They'll just, they'll feed a little bit in the very top of the tree. And we were talking about this, um, Jeremy and I, a little bit before um, we started. There are a lot of animals that, that like to eat pawpaw fruit, raccoons, possums, groundhogs. Um, he was talking about black bears. They probably do. We don't have bears here, but I wouldn't doubt that they would like to eat pawpaw fruit. They will eat fruit that drop on the ground, and if there's not a lot of food around, they'll even climb trees and eat the fruit. And it's hard to keep them out. I mean, beyond electric fences are really the best way, of course, to keep animals out, but it's hard to keep small animals like that out, even with electric fencing. So Really, it's just beating the animals to it, and we'll talk about that in a minute. You can pick the fruit when it's a little bit underripe, when it's just starting to get ripe. You can go ahead and pick it early and try to beat them to it. Deer are not usually a problem. They don't generally like to eat the leaves on pawpaw trees or even the fruit. I've heard some people say they'll eat the fruit, but I don't think it's one of their preferred foods. The bucks do seem to like to rub their antlers on pawpaws. I don't know why they would prefer them over anything else, but it seems like they're especially attracted <laughs> to rub their antlers on pawpaw trees, at least. Of, I think they like that size, the like one or two inch diameter, kind of medium size to rub on. So for growing pawpaws, you can start them yourself from seed. So um, the process to do that when you if you have a fruit, you take the seed out of the fruit and clean it. They do need cold stratification. So they do need um, 100 days, at least 100 days in the refrigerator in something to keep them damp. So we put, put them in damp peat moss in plastic bags in the refrigerator for at least 100 days. You can keep them longer than that. Um, you don't wanna let them dry out. They will reduce germination a lot if the seeds dry out and you can't store them in the freezer or um, that will kill the seeds also. A lot of nurseries start pawpaw seedlings in containers, these deep narrow containers because they do have a tap root. So a container that's a size and shape to accommodate the tap root. 
and they are not true to type from seed. So if you have a tree that you like or it's a cultivar and you save seed from that and plant it, it's not going to be identical to the parent. If it has good parents, then the seedling is likely to have good fruit or more likely to have good fruit. You just don't know exactly what you're going to get. But from a random wild tree, a lot of times the seedlings would not be that good. And they take about seven or eight years to produce fruit grown from seed. So since they're not true to type from seed, how to propagate them clonally. Papa, unfortunately, is kind of difficult to propagate. They won't root from stem cuttings or layering um, root cuttings. They will you can dig up roots and start some from roots, but it's kind of cumbersome. It's not an easy way to do it. So to propagate these cultivars, we um, graft, use grafting or budding. So I think most of you all are probably familiar with grafting, um, but just in case, I always put this in. It's just the process of connecting two plant parts. So the roots, um, which we call the root stock. In the case of pawpaw, that's just any seedling. So just um, a random, Papa seed, seedling of any source, is the rootstock. And then the scion is the piece of wood that you collect from the cultivar that you want to propagate, that you cut and place together, and that will heal up and continue to grow as one plant. So you can do several things. You can graft or bud onto small seedlings in containers or in the field. Um, and pretty much any grafting method works pretty well. Chip budding and whip and tongue are the ones that we use most commonly. Some people use cleft grafts. For some reason, tea budding does not work very well with papa. And you can use bark inlay grafting to top work larger diameter trees. And besides propagating a variety true to type, another good thing about grafted trees is they only take three or four years to produce fruit as opposed to seven to eight years. So again, pawpaws aren't true to seeds, so we really recommend planting a, a grafted cultivar um, faster to get fruit and you know what you're going to get. You know it's going to be good quality and have larger fruit, better yields, better flavor. So some recommended cultivars for this area. We do breeding at KSU, I mentioned. So KSU Atwood, KSU Benson, and KSU Chappelle are the three that we have released so far. And those all do really well in this area. Sunflower, Overlease, NC1, Susquehanna, Potomac, Wabash, and Shenandoah are some of the other cultivars that do well in this area. Now I've got pictures of a few of those. Um, KSU Atwood has um, kind of a mango flavor, a yellow orange colored flesh. It's our, one of the later ripening varieties that we have which late ripening for pawpaw is relative. It's not like apples where there's a huge range. So when I say late ripening, it's usually mid-September here. KSU Benson is our second cultivar release. It has really round fruit. That's one unique thing about it. It has kind of a baseball, softball shaped fruit. Um, it's early ripening, which means um, late August, sometimes August 20th, August 25th, somewhere in there, we'll start to see these getting ripe. KSU Chappelle is our most recent cultivar release. It's mid-season ripening, which is about the first week of September here. It's very vigorous, high yielding, and it has a little bit milder flavor than the others, a more yellow colored flesh and kind of a banana pineapple flavor. And all of these are good yielding, good size, low percent seed. So ours, I'll mention some nurseries here in a minute. Atwood, Benson, Chappelle, are available from licensed nurseries that we work with to propagate our trees. And I put in pictures of a couple of others, not of all of them that I had on the recommended list, but people a lot of times ask, what's the biggest pawpaw? Potomac is the biggest pawpaw that we had in our variety trials. The average fruit weight, 235 grams, so about um, a half a pound average um, fruit weights. A lot of the quite a few over a pound in size. They are somewhat prone to cracking, probably because they grow so big is the only drawback really to those. And a lot of people ask about the best tasting pawpaw, and I would put ours up there too, especially Chappelle is probably one of my, my personal favorite, but Susquehanna has won a lot of taste tests that we have had, 
here and at the Ohio Pawpaw Festival, it's won Best Pawpaw several times. So Susquehanna has really good flavor, definitely recommend that one. But others mentioned Sunflower and Shenandoah, they have a little bit more mild flavor for people who prefer that. If you like cantaloupe, then Overlease has kind of a melon flavor and NC1 and Wabash are two additional ones that we recommend that have more of a dark or orange colored flesh and also have good flavor. So in Kentucky, um, England's Orchard Nursery in McKee, which is close to Berea, is a really good source for pawpaw trees. Also Peaceful Heritage Nursery that's in Stanford. Nolan River Nursery, um, I would recommend, but unfortunately the owner passed away this year and I'm not sure what their status is gonna be, but next year they may be back in business. They're another good source for pawpaws. The uh, State Division of Forestry sells pawpaw seedlings. And so those are a lower cost way to get trees. So if you, you know, want to plant some seedlings to graft yourself or just see how, how the seedlings are going to turn out, that's what they sell them in bundles, bundles of 10 or I think even bundles of 100. And that is the phone number. They have different districts. That's for the um, one in Hazard, which I believe would be your all's district. Um, and the website. So that's a good source for low cost seedlings. And all three, England's Peaceful Heritage and Nolan River are all licensed propagators for KSU cultivar. So ours, you can buy it at any of those three. And I mentioned we're doing breeding. So we've got variety trials going on with um, several what we call advanced selections that we're evaluating that may be released in the future. So. Any pawpaw variety that has KSU in its name, you know, comes from us. So when you're harvesting pawpaws, that usually, like I said, begins in late August through early October is season here in Kentucky, Virginia. Unfortunately, they're a little bit labor intensive to pick, partly because skin color is not an indicator of ripeness usually. Sometimes they'll turn a little bit yellow, but in general, they're green even when they're ripe. I, the fruit will fall off the tree when they're ripe. So that's one of the easiest ways to see. You'll see fruit on the ground underneath the tree and you know that the, the fruit on that tree you're starting to get ripe. Um, to hand harvest, it's mostly by touch. So feeling it, seeing that it's starting to get a little bit soft, similar to a peach. It'll be a little bit soft when you squeeze it and they'll come off in your hand. So if you pull on it and it doesn't come off, then it's not ready to pick yet. But if you you know, touch the fruit, it's soft, you kind of wiggle it, it falls off in your hand, then it's ready to pick. They do bruise easily when they're ripe, so you don't want to stack them too deep in a box, like in that picture, or, you know, toss them to the ground because they will bruise easily. And you do harvest from the same tree over a period of several weeks. So a single tree, even within the same cluster, like one fruit in the cluster will get ripe before the rest of them are ready. So an individual tree you're usually harvesting for three weeks or so. And again, when they're ripe, they have, um, I don't think I mentioned this on the slide, you can start to pick them. We were talking about beating animals to the fruit. They have to be starting to get soft in order to ripe them, to pick them and ripen off the tree. So um, it's kind of by experience knowing what they feel like, but if you squeeze the fruit and it's hard as a rock, then it will not ripen off the tree. But if it's starting to get just a little bit soft, then the ripening process is starting and you can pick it and it will ripen off the tree. Um, you can put them in the refrigerator to store a little bit longer. So oh, I had that on the slide for some reason. I thought it was supposed to be on the other slide. But anyway, so yes, you can pick them when they're just starting to get soft, put them in the refrigerator for two or three weeks, and they will ripen off the tree. Um, freezing is the best way to store them long term. I will say, um, I don't think I have this on a slide, we don't recommend drying them for some reason. And I th guess we need to find out why. Um, drying pawpaw fruit or making fruit leather, a lot of people get sick to their stomach. So we think it's because pawpaws have a lot of fatty acids in them and kind of like avocado, a lot of good fats, and that the fats kind of go rancid in the drying process and can make people sick. But I've heard enough people say that, that we say don't, don't dry pawpaw fruit or make fruit leather. 
So the bruises um, a lot of times are bitter. So if you're processing the fruit or just eating it, you want to look out for that. Sometimes you'll see this pink discoloration inside, which is probably kind of like internal bruising, um, like internal damage to the fruit. And again, we mentioned that pawpaw peduncle borer. Occasionally you'll see one of those larvae. The skin is not edible, although I know some people that say they eat the skin and they don't think it tastes bad, but to most people it has a bitter flavor and you don't want to eat the skin. You also don't want to eat the seeds. Um, they have alkaloid compounds in them that will make you sick to your stomach, but they're big. They're like lima bean size and shape, hard seeds. So you're not going to accidentally eat a seed, but like if you are processing it to freeze it in a blender or making a smoothie or something like that, you don't want to accidentally get a seed in there. So to freeze the, um, the fruit, you can freeze them whole, but that takes up more room in the freezer. If you don't have a lot of fruit um, to process it by hand, we would just cut them in half, scoop out the insides and put it through either a colander put that in a colander and push it through with a spoon or put it in a mesh bag and kind of squeeze it through to separate the seeds. And that works well. It's just labor intensive if you have a lot of fruit that you're going to process. This is kind of the next step up. If you have quite a few fruit that you're wanting to process, um, this, the brand that we use is Roma, but there's, there's Squeezo and Victorinox. There's several brands that are the same type of food mill. And you want to use the pumpkin squash screen as the middle size screen and the grape spiral is what removes the seeds and you do need to modify that for pawpaws because it's made to remove grape seeds which of course are a lot smaller than pawpaw seeds so you need to cut off the last two spirals of that to make it wide enough for the pawpaw seed to pass through so there's still the step of either peeling it or cutting it in half and scooping out the insides you put it um, in the top of this device and push it through with that plunger and turn the crank or there is a motor you can get for it and that spiral removes the seeds and the flesh gets pushed through that screen um, to, to process the fruit. You see there's quite a bit of pulp still stuck to the seeds so you need to take that and run it through two or three times to get it as clean as possible. But this works really well and you can use it for lots of other fruits you see it's the picture from the company has tomatoes so it's used to process berries tomatoes um, persimmons lots of different fruits and vegetables this is what we're using right now this is more of a commercial piece of equipment um, but it is available we have a mobile kitchen which is somewhat mobile, a lot of times it stays at KSU, and a kitchen that I believe people can rent at the farm. I think COVID restrictions are probably, you can't write at this moment, but um, if you have a large amount of fruit and you want to rent space in our kitchen, we do have this device to use. It's basically a bigger souped up version of that food mill that I showed you before. It has you still unfortunately have to peel it or cut it in half, scoop out the insides, but there is kind of a tumbler inside with paddles and a screen, like a drum um, with screen around it that separates the seed from the flesh. The pulp comes out one side and the seeds come on the other side. This is a lot faster and gets the seeds a lot cleaner. You see how clean the seeds are in that than the other food mill device. So large fruit are really better for processing just because they have a lower percent seed. If it's a small seedy fruit, then you're not going to get much out of it. Um, this frozen pulp, we store it in the freezer for up to two years and it still has good quality. Thaw it in the refrigerator. Um, we don't put citric acid or lemon juice or anything in it, but if you thaw it, you know, open to air, it will brown a little bit around the edges. So then you can use this in ice cream baked goods, jam. We'll show, show a few recipes in a minute. So the nutritional composition, you see pawpaws high in lots of vitamins, minerals, higher than um, banana, apple, and orange, and just about all minerals except potassium. It's barely lower than banana, but you know, bananas are known for being high in potassium has significantly more protein and those good fats, monounsaturated fatty acids, than 
the other fruits. So as far as marketing pawpaws, where to sell them, if you want to sell them or where to buy them, if you're looking to buy them. On the fresh market, usually it is a local thing since they're hard to store and ship. So local farmers markets, local produce markets. Some people do online or mail order sales and they can sell for pretty high prices, selling to people you know, in areas of the country that can't grow pawpaws or don't. Um, but they are kind of difficult to pack well to get them at the right stage of ripeness and to package them well so that they don't get in too bad a shape in shipping. So since the fruit has such a short shelf life, really the frozen fruit and the value added products are um, probably the best way to market Pawpaw right now. Restaurants, wineries and breweries, especially the wineries and breweries and distilleries have bought most of the Pawpaws in the state that people are growing the last few years. So again, the beer, wine, brandy, moonshine, different things like that are the main, probably the most mainstream pawpaw products that are on the market right now. You can use pawpaw in baked goods. Basically anything that calls for banana, you can substitute pawpaw in, so bread, cakes, things like that, muffins. Um, it's really good in like a custard or creme brulee because of it, it has that creamy texture already. And hot sauces and salsa, you know, pawpaw is so sweet, you think of it like a dessert, but it's good kind of in the sweet, sweet and spicy type thing. So like a hot sauce or a mango salsa, but substitute pawpaw, barbecue sauce, things like that. And ice cream is probably everybody's favorite item that's made with pawpaw fruit. This is the recipe that we have developed and it's a really simple recipe to make, it doesn't have eggs or anything like that in it, just pawpaw and milk cream and sugar. And you can also just blend it with vanilla ice cream or top vanilla ice cream with it or blend with yogurt, make smoothies, things like that. And pawpaw jam, this is also a recipe that we've developed at KSU and we did taste tests, that's what's in the bottom right corner of a lot of different recipes that some of them were more like apple butter that had spices in it. And this was um, the favorite of most people that's just kind of plain straightforward pawpaw. That's just pawpaw, sugar, um, the pectin to make it set up and fruit fresh that just brings the acid to where you want it to be. So it's a really simple jam recipe. And I want to mention, um, we're on Facebook, so if you have Facebook, you can search for KSU Pawpaw. We have a Facebook page. We have a website, which unfortunately it used to be um, kysu.edu slash pawpaw, and it was just, it was easy to tell people, but they changed, the, they changed it to this long link. So um, anyway, you can copy that down and that, or if you search KSU Pawpaw, just search for it on the internet, it would be one of the first hits. And we do have a YouTube channel too. But a lot of what we've done now, our media team likes to use Facebook Live and videos on Facebook. So most of the YouTube videos are older and our more recent videos are on Facebook. So we can be found all of those places. And I think I noticed, let me stop sharing the screen. I think I saw some chat pop up. Yeah, I realized as I saw it flash, I thought, oh, people are asking questions. but. Um, I'll save that to the end. So yeah, if you have any questions, you can ask them out loud or just type them in. I'll answer the questions that are in chat now. Um, yeah, if wild plants start from, how do wild plants start from seedlings if freezing kills the seed? A lot of people ask that, and that is a good question. And it's probably both the temperature and the duration because probably mostly the duration because freezer is why about zero Fahrenheit for 24 hours a day, seven days a week for, you know, however long you're storing them in the freezer. So they will probably handle some freezing temperatures for shorter amounts of time or not quite that cold, but just not to be stored at that temperature for that long of a time. But also remember that wild plants, there's not a lot of them that start from seedlings. So when you see these wild patches with a lot of trees, they're mostly root suckers and there's just a few seedlings in the patch. So 
there's not a ton of them that sprout from seed in the wild anyway, but some of them do. And so, yeah, it's probably just that they, and they're also somewhat protected by, they would usually be in fruit, like in rotting fruit on the ground or in leaf litter. And so they'd be a little bit insulated by that too. Um, we don't see stink bugs on the fruit. So stink bugs do not seem to like pawpaw fruit, which is a good thing. We've got blackberries and those um, spotted wing drosophila, or I was thinking spotted wing drosophila. Stink bugs are a big problem in the blackberries, but they do not bother the pawpaws. And since I mentioned the fruit flies, the, that spotted wing drosophila doesn't get on pawpaw either. We, um, yes, do you use carrion to attract flies to pollinate? We don't, I, I know some people do because anything that will bring in flies will help pollination. We get good enough pollination anyway, and it's, we have livestock on, the, on our research farm and then we've got a lot of pawpaw trees too. Um, so it's not necessary. Some people do that. I would, I would probably rather not do that. I would, if you use like manure, you know, fresh manure on the trees or fish emulsion or something else that's stinky, then um, that would bring in flies too. But some people do put carrion in orchards too, or tie it in the trees or just set it in the orchards to attract flies. Um, and yeah, we did mention that at the end, pawpaws are used to make wine. So they make a really sweet dessert wine. And one thing I've heard from the winemakers is it's hard to get it clear. I think the fruit is so kind of creamy that the pawpaw wine is usually kind of cloudy, which a lot of winemakers don't don't prefer, but um, it's, it makes a good sweet dessert wine. So yeah, wine and beer and brandy and lots of different things like that. Sherry, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, great, great information. Uh, anybody else have any questions, comments, whatever? Uh, Sherry, I was going to comment. I, I was kind of interested. You said that uh, the fruit leather makes you sick. Um, I know when I was an agent in Whitley County, we had a case where uh, um, one of our master gardeners had made pawpaw fruit leather and brought, brought it in and people tried it. And uh -huh. I remember one of the ladies got up and ran to the restroom and we could hear her just, just retching um, while, yeah. while, this, while this other master gardener was talking about how wonderful the, the, the pawpaws are, but it was, right. I mean, it hit her, hit her pretty hard. Yeah. That's not, not a good introduction to pawpaw. <laughs> so, I, I didn't realize it was a common thing. I thought maybe she'd had a, a, a reaction or something. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it affects everybody. It doesn't seem like it's everybody that eats it. Um, but like I said, it's common enough. I've had enough people email me and tell me things like that, that it's, it seems common enough that I would say don't make fruit leather out of it. We got a freeze dryer last year, and we're kind of curious if a freeze dryer would be the same way, because that would take all the moisture out of it. So I wonder if, if freeze dried would be okay, but just regular dried isn't. Who's um, trying that? I know that's the thing is like, who's going to be the guinea pig to try that? <laughs> But so yeah, so don't dry it, freeze it. You can make all these other goodies out of it, but yeah, don't make fruit leather out of it. Definitely great information. I know you mentioned the uh, the places that you buy the buy the trees at. Um, uh, I know the Division of Forestry they they do sell those, and it's listed on their order form. Um, that's the Kentucky Division of Forestry, and uh, it just mentions pawpaws. It, I guess we just really don't know what the variety is or, or did the other places actually, can you buy that certain variety from them? What the division of forestry sells just unnamed seedlings. Mm -hmm. And they actually originally got their seed from us. They came and picked up old fruit off the ground. So the genetics are from what we have. So they, they should have some decent, um, decent stuff. They haven't, I think they have their own trees that they collect from now. So I, which are probably the progeny of those. So anyway, the background actually comes from us, but they're just unnamed seedlings. So yeah, those you don't know what you're gonna get. So you could, could grow them and see if there's something good or you could get them to use as rootstock to graft onto. Okay, so, but it, it, it's one of those, if I went to one of the nurseries, I could probably get the, the Potomac or, or whatever. 
Yes, yeah, the nurseries that I listed sell those named cultivars. Right. Yes, yeah, just the Division of Forestry, they just sell seedlings. But um, yeah, all three of those nurseries. And if you go to our website, there's a longer list of nurseries. Um, those are just the ones in Kentucky. But yeah, those sell the grafted trees of the named cultivars. Okay, great. Um, good question here from Woody. How much fruit does one tree produce? <laughs> yeah, so a mature, um, a good producing, you know, mature tree would produce usually 50 to 75 pounds. I would say 50 pounds on average, 50, 60 pounds on average of fruit a year once it's mature. Um, it does take a while to get up to maturity because even the grafted trees take three or four <coughs> years to start producing fruit. But then like the first year, you know, they'll just have a few fruit and then the next year they'll have a few more. So it, it takes a few more years to get up to mature production. But um, usually about 50 to 75 pounds, pounds, I may have said fruit, 50 to 75 pounds of fruit per tree okay. on average. So. Great. Good information. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, are there any other questions? And you can always, I'll type my email address in the, um, okay. Very good. Thank you in the chat box. So if you have any questions in the future or think of anything afterwards, then always can feel free to email and um, ask any pawpaw questions. Um, I didn't mention this because since it's a ways away, but I think several of you are already familiar with the third Thursday thing that KSU has. So the third Thursday of every month we have sustainable agriculture workshops, either in person, hopefully next year we'll be back in person. This year it was virtual. So September is always Papa. So the third Thursday of September, we'll have something, whether it's again, hopefully in person next year or online um, about Papa's and we have, you know, tour our orchards and have fruit to taste and things like that. So if you wanna mark it on your calendar in advance, that'll be third Thursday of September. All right, sounds good, thank you. Well, yeah, thank you. you're welcome. If there's nothing else, Sherry, thank you so much for joining us this evening and a great presentation, great information. I know it give, definitely gives a, another aspect to pawpaws that are, that are, it's more than just the ones out here, like I said, in our yard or out here on the side of the mountain. I think, I think it's great uh, and yeah. really good information. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Yeah, I think a lot of people are surprised they see fruit that are like that and they, their jaws drop and they're like is that a pawpaw like, yeah they can get that big so yeah. so yeah lots of lots of potential there I think and again I think I mentioned that if there's anybody there that's thinking about growing them commercially um, wineries and distilleries were buying all the fruit that growers in the state had and needing more than what they could get so I think there is a lot of potential for more commercial production than there is right now so great Great. That's, that's, that's good news. That's definitely something to look forward to. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. One more question, real quick. Were sure. there any medicinal uses for this? There is. There are compounds that are, especially in the leaves and twigs, that are anti-cancer compounds. So um, there's extracts from the twigs and the leaves that are used in a, have a natural cancer treatment. But it's, it's something for cancer patients. It's not something that you would want to take to prevent cancer, but it's kind of an alternative medicine for, um, for cancer patients. But yeah, so there are medicinal compounds that can be extracted from them. Wow, that's great to me. Yeah. Awesome, good deal. Yeah, yeah. Deal. any other questions? Uh, there's nothing else. Sherry, thank you so much. Phil, do, do yes. you have anything to add on, on the coming weeks or Shad on the coming weeks from the Mountain Zoom? I don't. I'll just say thank you again for the presentation. It was fantastic. And, uh, and I guess we don't have any sessions next week. We, it'll be December 1st. I think that's, uh, is that John Strang again? Uh, did we not move that to, I think we moved that to the following week. And so I think it's portable sawmills on the third. Is that what we have? Okay. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And move that to the night. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. Okay. Now I know uh, Phil, you've got a you've got a pretty big uh, pretty big deal coming up this weekend on Saturday. 
Uh, you want to mention that? Yeah, we're having our um, Southwest Virginia Tree Syrup School coming up. Uh, it's, it's via Zoom. That's on Saturday morning, uh, 9 a.m. to 12 noon. We've got uh, speakers from uh, uh, Ohio State University, uh, Joe Boggs, that's somebody that Chris uh, arranged for us. He's going to talk about the Asian longhorn beetle and its potential impacts to the maple industry. We've got Mike Farrell, uh, former extension person, uh, I think Cornell. Uh, he was, he's going to be talking about American beach syrup. And uh, then we've got uh, a couple other topics. Uh, so, do you have a flyer uh, for that that you've already put together? I do. Uh, it should be. Uh, should be able to find it if you go into the uh, Wise County Extension Facebook page. There's a link there, and there's a registration. Well, like you all did with yours, we 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 got a registration link, and um, I think we're up to. Well, as of this morning, we had 94 people registered. Wow. So I think, of course, you know, not all those will show up, but we're we're hoping a lot of them do. Now, would you ask a question? Is there still a special session tomorrow night? Yes. Uh, what I did, uh, we, we had some demand for just some basic syrup making. And so tomorrow night, Chris is going to cover that for us at um, 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Friday night, just the basics of, of making syrup. So if anybody wants that, you can email me and, uh, and we'll send you that link. Awesome. Good stuff. Well, good deal. Sherry, thank you very much uh, again. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. It was good. Good to see you all. And yeah, glad to participate in, in your Zoom series. It'll go out to more people than we're on here tonight. We, we loaded up to Facebook and YouTube. So uh, what's it called when it's yeah. in indication, you'll, you'll get tons of views. Yep. Good, good. Yeah. Definitely. Good to know. So uh, I guess until December the 3rd at 6 o'clock, and that's Portable Saw Mills. Uh, everybody have a great Thanksgiving and a good evening, and we'll see you all then. Y'all yes. have a good night. Thanks, Sherry. Bye. You're welcome. Uh, Thanks thank for having you. me. Bye. Thank you.